I don't just talk about other people's stuff. I also make my own. Books in particular. To date, I have four books you can check out on Amazon. Operation Red Dragon, The Daikaiju Wars Part 1, Occult Mafia, Emerald of Maddox City, and the short story collection Assorted Absurdities, Tales of Kaiju Punk, and Other Genres. Hop on down to the description for Amazon links to all four books. Enjoy whichever ones you read, and enjoy the video. Have you ever seen a movie that you were certain was about something, but the meaning was so obfuscated that you started questioning your own abilities of perception? That's kind of how I feel about The Great Buddha Arrival. However, before I can talk about The Great Buddha Arrival, I must first talk about The Great Buddha Arrival. You lost me. Get used to it. The Great Buddha of Shugakuen in Ueno Village is the largest Buddha statue in Japan. It's a popular tourist attraction in addition to being a culturally significant icon. Back in 1934, film director Yoshiro Edemasa directed what is generally considered to be Japan's first kaiju film, entitled The Great Buddha Arrival, in which the statue stands and walks around Japan, as well as journeying to heaven and hell. Nobody alive today has ever seen the film, though, because all known copies of it were destroyed during World War II. Unless a reel was preserved somewhere safe, it is a lost film. Only a few promotional stills survive to give us a hint of what it looked like. Of course, being a lost film means it was easily overshadowed by Godzilla two decades later, and for a long time, a lot of people forgot it even existed. Well, the folks at 3Y Film remembered it, and with the blessing of Edamasa's grandson, they made their own version, originally released in Japan in 2018 and now available in the West on DVD. I notice you said their own version. What does that even mean? Is the new movie a remake or a sequel? That's where things get complicated, Snazzy. The 2018 movie opens with... Well, actually it opens with text that briefly summarizes how this movie came to be. Once that's done, though, we open on Akira Takarada being interviewed by the 3Y crew, discussing the original Lost film as a Lost film, and comparing it to Godzilla and the Golem. That presents the idea that the original movie is just a movie in-universe. Then we see the main character, simply named Murata, editing a film about the real-life mystery of when the Great Buddha walked around in the 30s, so that would mean the original movie is real in-universe. Not long after that, we learn that both answers are true. Apparently, the Great Buddha really did get up and walk around, allegedly at least, and Yoshiro Edamasa witnessed this firsthand, which inspired him to make the movie. Then we see people debating photos allegedly showing the real event, but are they really photos of the statue moving around, or stills from the movie? Sheesh, how meta can you get? Even Deadpool would tell them to dial it back a little. I know what you mean, Snazzy. Of all the kaiju movies I've seen, The Great Buddha Arrival is the first one I would describe as postmodern. Even when it's not directly shattering the fourth wall, it's still leaning heavily on it. For example, a lot of familiar faces from all sorts of kaiju films appear in this movie, and their contributions usually reference the movies and shows they starred in. This guy tells Murata about how, as a child in the 60s, he fell from a lighthouse, only to be saved when the Great Buddha caught him in its massive hand. That would be Yoshiro Uchida, who played Toshiro, or as us gaijin know him, Kenny, in Gamera the Invincible, and his account is lifted straight from that film. Peggy Neal's character, Mary Lisa Gleason, is named after the two characters she played respectively in Terror Beneath the Sea and The X from Outer Space, while Akira Kubo's Prime Minister is named after his character in Son of Godzilla. Yukijiro Hotaru, meanwhile, appears as a police detective just like he did in the Heisei Gamera trilogy. The list goes on and on. There are all kinds of people you will recognize in this film. But this movie isn't just about celebrity cameos. During the opening credits, we get a few shots recreating what scenes from the original 1934 film may have looked like. These scenes use the traditional methods that would have been available in the 30s, and they look so authentic that when I first saw the film at G-Fest in 2019, I thought 3Y had somehow found surviving footage. Another sequence in this style occurs roughly halfway through the film. This sequence, where the only audio is a very haunting underscore, serves as a flashback to the past where mass suicides and a devastating earthquake led to the Great Buddha's rising. This might be the best sequence in the whole movie, and its commitment to the old-fashioned aesthetic is spot-on. Mind you, that's not to say the modern sequences are bad. 
The contemporary Great Buddha is realized with CGI, and thanks to being a concrete statue, it doesn't need too many details and thus looks pretty good. Heck, even the fact that the Great Buddha isn't a very expressive entity doesn't bother me. I've taken umbrage with recent Godzilla films for depicting the G-Man as a nearly motionless non-entity who just walks forward without displaying any emotion. Technically, the Great Buddha also fits that description, but I mean, it is a statue, so how expressive and mobile can you expect it to be? Did you forget about Daimajin? Okay, fair point. I guess I don't know exactly why it doesn't bother me here. Maybe it's because the supernatural aspect lends itself better to something that's meant to be totally unreadable. Granted, we see the limitations of the effects with this version. A lot of shots are recycled during the statue's stroll, but I can let that slide because this is, after all, a low-budget indie film. Besides, recycling kaiju footage was a common practice in the Showa era, so maybe that's just another part of the homage. As you probably noticed by now, The Great Buddha Arrival is a real love letter to Kaiju Eiga. The film was made by people who love the genre and wanted to pay tribute to it by going back to its roots. I certainly appreciate the effort, and it does make the film memorable. Wait, I know that tone. You're about to get into something negative, aren't you? Unfortunately, yes. After three years of trying to figure this movie out, I think I finally reached a conclusion, but it will require me to go into spoiler territory. Every other time I've spoken about the Great Buddha arrival on this channel, I've seen comments beneath the video from people who claim to have somehow worked on the film. I've never been able to substantiate these claims myself, but I've always acted on the assumption that they are true. Now, that means a part of me wants to tread carefully going forward, lest I come across as vindictive in my critiques, but the other part of me demands that I be honest, as I always am. So if anyone who made the film or somehow worked on it really is watching this, please don't take offense when I say that the Great Buddha Arrival really doesn't make sense thematically. Early on, we are told that Yoshira Edamasa's films had a common theme about death, and the flashback sequence gives us a fictionalized reason as to why. Back in the 30s, an earthquake followed by mass suicides rocked Japan, and Edamasa was affected when his... I'm going to say wife killed herself by jumping off a bridge. He was ready to do that himself when the Great Buddha appeared, and its presence alone was enough to stop him. This, combined with the testimonies of other eyewitnesses, paints the Great Buddha as a benevolent figure who intervenes to preserve life. In the contemporary setting, there's wild speculation about the Great Buddha, but two testimonies in particular really stand out. First up are these two master debaters. One of them believes that the statue is fueled by quote-unquote dark energy, and the other thinks the first guy is an idiot with no evidence to support his claim. Then, of course, we have Dr. Mary Lisa Gleason, introduced as an expert on religious mysteries. She states that the statue's ability to get up and move should be seen as a sign from on high that there is still hope for humanity. The juxtaposition of these two interviews supports the idea that the Great Buddha is a positive entity. The guy who theorizes about dark energy, something that sounds like a malevolent force, doesn't have a leg to stand on in supporting his theory, nor does it line up with anything else we see. Dr. Gleason's analysis, however, lines up quite well with the evidence before us. True, she can't technically substantiate her claims either, but we in the audience can, and it all points towards something hopeful. Okay, so the movie is presenting a tale of hope for humanity. Everything seems to be lining up, so what's the problem? The problem comes at the finale. I already warned you about spoilers, so this is your last chance to bail out. I have to give away the whole ending in order to explain my thoughts properly. The Great Buddha eventually stops walking in the heart of Tokyo, where Murata has followed it. The statue begins glowing, bathing the entire landscape in golden light, and people start walking towards it as though in a trance. Murata, however, gets stopped by none other than the ghost, I suppose, of Yoshiro Edamasa, who tells him not to hasten his death. Murata looks away for a second, asking what all of this means, only for Edamasa to vanish as the light becomes blinding. Then Murata wakes up in the ruins of Tokyo, which, according to this headline, was ravaged by an earthquake. Murata wanders through the city, finding only ruins and no other people, not even dead bodies. He gets to the wreckage of the 3Y studio, and within is a working computer. He finishes editing the footage and sends the completed film to his producers, only to then realize that he's been staring at a blank screen the whole time. Well, maybe he realizes it. 
His expression is hard to read here. And as the camera pans over the devastated city, the movie ends. Roll credits. Uh... What? My thoughts exactly. After all of this time building up the Great Buddha as a benevolent figure, the plot suddenly veers in a totally different direction. I get that this is meant to parallel the events from the 30s. What with the earthquake, the mass suicides, the intervention of a supernatural being on behalf of one person, and the ambiguity of whether or not the statue really got up and moved around. But in doing that, a wrench is thrown into the gears of the movie's theme. Itamasa's intervention at this precise moment and his warning that going towards the statue leads to death seems to imply that the statue is in fact dangerous. But by not going towards it, Murata is left in an abandoned city with a tenuous grip on reality. There appears to be a dichotomy set up between Adamasa and the Great Buddha. One represents life, the other represents death. One brings enlightenment, the other is a deceiver. The question is, which one is which? Did Adamasa save Murata from oblivion, or prevent him from attaining paradise? And for that matter, how can Adamasa and the Buddha be opposed to each other? One of the interview segments in the film within a film says that Itamasa was brought to the land of happiness by the Great Buddha, which doesn't sound so bad, so wouldn't they be on the same side if that happened? Wait, I thought that clip came from the part where Murata was hallucinating. Was that part real or not? Search me. Heck, how can we be sure any of this was real? Was the statue really walking around, or was it all just a fever dream Murata had while fighting to stay alive after an earthquake? If the statue really moved, why did the headlines say it was an earthquake? If it was an earthquake and none of it was real, what about the post credit scene that implies the statue can move after all? In either case, is Murata fortunate or unfortunate to have survived? Or did he not survive and this is all his own private hell? Was the film he was making even real? Is the blank screen just a reference to the original film's destruction, or does it have a deeper significance than that? Was any of this supposed to be real? Am I real? Am I even making a video about this, and are you even watching it? Omni, calm down. Ease it back a little. Yeah, yeah, um, maybe I need a minute to refocus myself. Sorry for spiraling back there. It's just that I've spent three years trying to figure this movie out, and thinking that the problem was somehow with me. I wondered if I didn't understand it because I'm not a Buddhist, or maybe there was a scene missing from the version I first saw. Having gotten a chance to see the movie again, though, I'm now thinking that the reason I've been confused this whole time is because the movie itself doesn't even know what it's saying. Well, you did say it was postmodern at the beginning of this video. Do you think it's the kind of postmodern that just uses the term as an excuse to be confusing? Well, I don't want to believe that, but the evidence is compelling. Part of the maybe imaginary film Murata puts together at the end is another interview clip with Akira Takarada. In this clip, he says the role of kaiju films is to show how science can have negative consequences in the world. Okay, I agree with that sentiment. But I can definitely say that's not what the Great Buddha Arrival is about. It has literally nothing to do with science at all, unless you count the bike that's tricked out with a jet engine as science, but its existence doesn't lead to any negative consequences. Heck, it could have been a regular bicycle for all that it matters. The source of this film's plot is magic, something considered the opposite of science, at least these days, but what it's saying about magic and its effect on the world doesn't come together by the end. Then, in the exact same clip, Takarada says that it's the role of filmmakers to help the audience understand these themes for the betterment of all mankind. Wow, that's pretty ironic given how muddled the meaning of this movie is. Ironic in the extreme. Yet even as I find myself thinking that the movie pulls the rug out from under the audience just for the heck of it, I still can't shake the feeling that I'm missing something. If anyone involved in making this movie really is watching this and has an explanation, I'm willing to hear it out. Enlighten me, if you will. For now, though, I can only conclude that The Great Buddha Arrival is a mixed bag. On the one hand, it's a loving tribute to the entire genre of Kaiju Ega and the people who have worked within it. But on the other hand, it either doesn't know what it wants to say or doesn't know how to say it. And that's all I can say for now. Until such time as we meet again, this is the Omni Viewer signing off.
what a sequel would be. Great Buddha versus Great Sphinx of Giza? Maybe a team up with Christ the Redeemer and Mount Rushmore? And how meta would those ones get? Congratulations, you reached the end. If you enjoyed this video, you might want to consider supporting us on Patreon. Of course, the other way to support us is to go to Amazon and check out our books. Operation Red Dragon, The Daikaiju Wars Part 1, The Occult Mafia, Emerald of Maddox City, and Assorted Absurdities, Tales of Kaiju Punk, and other genres. Also, check the description for links to DeviantArt and other platforms we operate. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time.